Welcome to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio show and podcast featuring your physician hosts, Dr. Tom McGovern and Dr. Andrew Mullally, where we and our guests discuss relevant and health-related topics from an authentically Catholic perspective. Dr. Doctor is brought to you in part by the generous underwriting of CMF Curo. Learn more at mycatholichealthcare.org. Live your Catholic faith in your healthcare with CMF Curo. Returning to us here on Dr. Doctor as our guest today on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network is pediatrician and mother of seven, Kathleen Birchelman, who's going to enlighten us about a topic about which there's very little disagreement, childhood training and discipline. Yes, oh, yeah, that was sarcasm. An one. <laughs> <laughs> that's an easy one, right. And she has the perspectives both as a medical expert and a parent with years of experience. Now, Andrew, I bet you get just a couple, two, three questions about this every day as a family physician. How important is this topic based on your experience? You know, it's it's so interesting because frequently the, the, you know, and this might be true for so many things in medicine, the people you want to broach the topic with are not always the ones who are asking the questions. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And uh, sometimes they are, sometimes it coincides. I had a really good conversation with a couple this week where there are times, especially <coughs> with your first child or the, the, the couple I was talking to is a blended family. Um, which pr provides its own challenges. Uh, but you have to learn how to discipline as a parent. That is a, one of the essential roles of being a, a good parent and not doing a terrible job. And we <laughs> all have to learn it. And people might go about it different ways. But what our goal in, in, in this episode, hopefully, is to bring to light some of the things that pretty much everybody would agree on, some strategies, and also what to think about. If you haven't thought about it yet, uh, what you should be thinking about, especially if maybe you're about to have your, your first child or maybe your first child is still perfect and they're like eight <laughs> months old uh, and, and you, you got to buckle up because Dr. Bershelman going to help us, you know, Sherpa us along this path, hopefully. Sherpa us. Ooh, nice term, Andrew. You know, I, I give talks on joy and I've learned joy is the reward for a, living a life well, living a life of virtue. And, you know, as Catholics, you know, well, my wife and I, you know, we tell our kids, we're not raising you to get to Harvard. We're raising you to get to heaven. And the book of Proverbs gives some great advice about forming virtuous children. You know, one of them, 22.6, you know, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And in Proverbs in chapter one, hear my son, and I'm sure daughters are included here too, your father's instruction and reject not your mother's teaching for they are a fair garland for your head and pendants for your neck. And finally from Proverbs three, don't despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof for he reproves the one he loves. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's true. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about, you know, there's modern parenting trends. There's, you know, helicopter parenting, there's tiger moms, there's parents trying to be their kids' best friends. I mean, I'm sure you see all kinds of things in your practice. Yeah, 100%. And even more than than these specific like stereotypes, I would say there's the people who have not thought about discipline or don't have a plan. And um, the, the one thing I know for sure is if you want to get to Milwaukee and you don't have a plan, you will not get there. Um, and so <laughs> discipline is the same type of thing. If you know how you want to raise your children and how you want them to behave or what, what is expected of them, uh, it's important to have a plan of how to get there. And so that's one of the things we hope to equip you with. And, you know, that, that quote from Proverbs, uh, chapter three, I think is very useful. Do not despise the Lord's discipline. Really, when you're a parent and you're disciplining and raising a child, in, in some ways, you are standing in, in that place the Lord has given you to discipline the child so that they will accept the Lord's discipline. And if a child will not accept the discipline of a parent, or if, if you do a terrible job, or if you tell them that discipline is not important by, by actual words or actions, it's going to be really hard for your child to understand the importance of true freedom and doing what is right and not just what they want. Um, I think many people feel like it's you can give kids a pass. They're just kids. They don't really understand. They'll understand someday. I'm going to give you a newsflash, at least what I see. 
Uh, if you're not trying to make them understand, they're not going to understand later when they're bigger than you and can drive. Um, so I think that hopefully we can put a plan together for everybody who doesn't have one. And I think Dr. Bershman will be able to teach us all some tips. I'm always interested in new strategies because I've got seven kids and uh, they all find new new things that you think you got to figure it out, you know, after your first kid. And then all the kids have little curveballs and you've constantly got to be improving your game. And uh, especially when it comes to discipline. It's like they're working with each other to figure out ways around you. You know, it, that'll be interesting. All three of us on this show will have seven kids. I, I always think ages. of my kids kind of like almost prisoners of war. Like they know how many <laughs> steps it takes for me to get from the, the sofa to my bedroom. Okay, dad's coming quick. Three, two, one. Okay, go, 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 go. <laughs> and, uh, they they know when they've got you kind of over a barrel. Okay, we're in church. Dad can only you know really chew me out so so much in church. There's people everywhere, <laughs> and so uh, I'll be interested to see what what Dr. Bershelman recommends. And you said you'd honor some good stuff on discipline that uh, you might want to share. Yeah, you know, I I did in in looking at secular sources. Obviously, this is a Catholic medical radio show, and so that's where we're coming from. But there's a secular source that I found useful in talking to my patients who may not be religiously inclined and they've never heard of Proverbs. Um, and one of the sources that I like to point to is a guy named Jordan Peterson. He's enjoyed some notoriety of late with books that he's written, and he's talked uh, to some extent about strategies in raising children. One of the, the biggest things that he says that I really like from a secular perspective is that we stand in the place of telling the children what is acceptable to live in society. And so he's got a whole series of, of rules and recommendations, such as limit the number of rules that you actually make. And when disciplining, use the minimum necessary force. But the one that I, I find the most compelling is kind of a overarching theme of what am I trying to accomplish? From a Catholic point of view, we want to get our kids to heaven. Uh, from a secular point of view, we as parents stand in as proxies for the real world. And I always tell folks, if, if you can't expect a kindergarten teacher to deal with this behavior, you should not tolerate it at home. Uh, if a child has to be corrected, it would be much better coming from you who love them and who's invested in their success rather than a cop or a judge or a boss or somebody else down the way who's going to love them a lot less but regardless, we'll have to correct them. Excellent. And as usual, before we go to our special guest interview, we have our medical trivia question of the day. Here we go. There are tiger moms who tend to be aggressive and panda moms who employ a hands-off style that tries to achieve the, quote, perfect ratio of cuddliness and claw, end quote. And there are helicopter parents who hover over their children and take too much responsibility for them. But there is also now the snowplow parenting style. Question, what do snowplow parents do for their children? You may know, you may not, but you'll hear the answer here on Dr. Doctor at the end of the show. We'll be back after the break with Dr. Kathleen Birchelman. Welcome back to Dr. Doctor, where we now have with us Dr. Kathleen Birchelman to talk about practical parenting tips. She's a pediatrician and cosmetic who in cosmetic and uh, Connecticut. Yes. We just the last taped the show on cosmetics. That was the last episode. All right. <laughs> Kathleen is a pediatrician and works in Connecticut and with her husband co-founded and runs mycatholicdoctor.com, a telemedicine platform providing virtual medical care around the United States. Not only does she understand childhood training as a pediatric specialist, but also as the mother of seven children. Kathleen, welcome back to Dr. Doctor. Thank you gentlemen for having me back. It's just a joy to be here. Thank you, Kathleen. So as we get into the nitty gritty of this, first, I think we need an overarching uh, way of looking at things. So what recommendations do you have for parents about forming a healthy perspective as to the reason behind all of our childhood training and discipline? You know, the most healthy perspective any parent can have on parenting is that you're not perfect, right? And But you're made in the image and likeness of God. You are. And so you have a perfect mother and a perfect father in heaven. And so we try to, to follow their example. And it's an example that's been written by history and it's been written in the Bible and it's been um, described by our church. And you don't need to invent something new. 
uh, this is, uh, you know, written in the natural law and it's on our hearts. So Kathleen, it seems like a lot of modern parents are more concerned about keeping their kids happy than our parents were when we were growing up. So what role do entertainment and fun play in raising our children? Well, I tell my children all the time what I believe the Lord tells us, that we're made for greatness, not comfort. And I think that's actually one of, you know, one of the lies of the evil one, frankly, is, is that actually you're made for comfort, not greatness. And so we have to reverse that. Just keep telling the kids you're made for greatness, not comfort. And I want you to be great. And I want you to be strong. And I want you to be God's servant. And we're going we're gonna to help you be, you know, seek greatness, not comfort. So, Kathleen, you know, what, I guess, in an overarching way, what are some of the goals of discipline when it relates to children? What are some of the benchmarks that we're shooting for? Well, first and foremost, that you, your children, you want your children to understand and grow in the virtues. And that's what we're shooting for with discipline. And I think one of the greatest stories of discipline is the life story of St. Teresa of Lisia and her parents who are both saints, right? Saints Louis and Zelie and Martin. And that family, you know, there's a beautiful icon of that family. And it's one of the few icons of a whole family. And I think all families should look at this and try to learn from it. Um, and it's really been instrumental to our family. But this family became saints, not because they, you know, started some huge institution, right? Be but because they were great in the, doing the normal and raising a holy family. And that's what we're all called to do as parents, right? And, and, and so I, just list, learning their lives and reading that story is, is so powerful. And one of the greatest takeaways for me from the story of the Martin family is that they came, there was, it was actually an era in France where there was a very strict approach towards child rearing. And even in the church, things were quite strict and it was related to the period of Jansenism, et cetera. But the Martin family was a gentle, they were gentle parents. And it came actually through raising um, one of their children, Leone, was extremely difficult. And, uh, uh, and, and Therese writes about this, about how, she, you know, is that how Leone purified all of them. And certainly Zeli and Louis write about um, uh, trying to raise this very difficult child who many people now suggest may have had autistic spectrum. And she certainly had learning disabilities and big temper tantrums, et cetera. And what was the message? It was the little way, right? Small things with great love. Do small things with great love. You don't, don't, your greatness doesn't come from achieving momentous things, but from doing tiny things with great love. And that's how we raise our children, right? That the smallest things we do with great love are, are seen by the Lord with great favor and they make you great. E Kathleen, you mentioned you something there that reminds me of a story of St. Teresa, which confirms what you were saying, that her parents were not raising her super strict. Remember, she was like 15 years old. She got to go before the Pope. I think it was Leo the 13th and she wanted to go and everyone told her, don't talk to him. Don't talk to him. Don't talk to him. What does she do? She goes up and she talks to him and she asks him. So she felt safe in front of this earthly father figure of the whole church. So she must have been raised that way at home. Does that make sense? It certainly does. And she certainly felt safe in front of the Lord, right? And yes, it's that safety that allowed her to love the Lord with all her heart all her mind and all her soul and then fear the lord which is of course you know uh, um fear of the lord is a, a gift of the holy spirit and it's so important the fear of the lord comes later the love comes first you know kathleen you had mentioned uh in that last answer the word strict and i think a lot of parents especially i, I think folks who might be tuning into this episode in particular feel like how how can i do discipline better so how should we decide how strict or not strict we should be and how many rules to have, you know, things of that nature? And, and you know, there's no one right way to raise a child. There's no formula, right? 
And so first and foremost, I want to, I want to say that, that, you, that as a parent, you have to be faithful in prayer to the Holy Spirit, like all the time, all day, because there's no one, you know, formula about how to raise this child or any child. Um, but I do think that rules need to be reiter reiterated constantly and they need to be very clear. And it's kind of like kindergarten class, you know, there's a set of house rules in big letters on a poster, maybe in first grade, they do this when the kids can start to read, you know, constantly reiterating the same sets of rules. And guess what? That's how the Lord raises us, right? They're called the 10 commandments. And you can do the same thing in your home, right? Your home is, is, is your kingdom and you write your commandments. And in the same way, like religious orders, they have their rule that they follow. You know, you write the rule for your family. And in fact, it's, it's, it's your obligation as a, as a parent. And so at, at our house, we have the Birchelman Ten Commandments. We certainly teach our kids the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and then we have the Birchelman Ten Commandments, right, um, which are our house rules. And actually, uh, they're like laminated in, in, on the wall in every bathroom in front of the toilet and in the kitchen. <laughs> wow. So, so Kathleen, there's a lot of terms that are around raising children. You know, raising is one, parenting, training, discipline. You know, th those first three are often seen as positive. Discipline is often seen as negative. What's the relationship between those terms and the reality of bringing up children? Well, I don't like to, I, the term negative in terms of parenting has become really socially uh, unacceptable. There's this movement of positive parenting um, that says that you know no negative reinforcement. And my answer to that is, except that's not how God raises us. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> like so, you know, negative reinforcement is used by the Lord for all of us, and we as parents can can and should use negative reinforcement. So, um, negative reinforcement is not negative. It raises. Uh, that's what we're called to do as parents. So negative reinforcement is actually part of positive parenting. So there you go. There's my positive parenting. So, so Europe. Yeah, I was going to say, Kathleen, what's the, the right, I guess, maybe we start with the definition of what is negative reinforcement as opposed to positive reinforcement. And what are some examples of those? Sure. So positive reinforcement is like, you know, if you get this whole page of math problems done, then we are going to go outside and for 10 minutes and do jump rope or, you know, whatever, um, food treats, whatever. That's, that would be a basic example of positive reinforcement or even more basic as the toddler that when you go pee pee and poo poo in the potty, you get an M&M, &M, right? Um, <laughs> the, the negative reinforcement, which I would it would be, you know, negative consequences. So this is, I don't actually recommend negative consequences for potty training. So let's talk about the kid who's not doing their homework. You know, you know, if you don't get your homework done, you can't have that friend over on Friday. We're going to be doing all your back makeup homework together. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. For both of you. <laughs> so how, how early can you start? How young can you start a child with both negative or positive reinforcement? I actually think very early. And this is where, you know, my views are going to be pretty controversial. I just have to say that right, right here. Um, that I'm, negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement can be gentle and small, but I, I start it right at about 12 months. And, and you, you have to really watch that child though it's dependent on the child and their development not a specific age so you have to really watch that child now i will put a 12 month old in time out for one minute i will um and and i'll, I'll be standing on the other side of the door and say and you know keep reiterating the same instructions but you know i'll do it and it works right and counting to three you know if i count to three uh, then and you don't come back to mom then you're going in time out right and um if you dump out that whole you know can of peaches on the floor um, <laughs> you know and, and you know then you're gonna have to help mom clean it up if you have a bad attitude about cleaning up you're gonna go to time out and for one minute until you're ready to help me clean up the peaches for for my kids i feel like it's always the electrical outlets and i'm like no don't touch that and they look at you and they touch it just, just to see what happens. Right. I said, wait a minute. I know exactly what this is. The time has come, you know, because I think you're right. A lot of people would say, oh, that's just a baby. They don't understand. But I know one of the things 
I feel like I, I got a lot in medical training. I'm sure you even more as a pediatrician is kids know so much more than sometimes they let on, especially early in childhood. Yeah. You know, can, can you speak to that about what, what we should, you, you had mentioned a couple of good examples uh, in your life. Maybe when should a parent think now's a good time for me to start with a plan for discipline? I think you start for with a plan for discipline around 12 months. If you're talking, if discipline includes negative reinforcement, if discipline includes structure, meaning structured feeding and bedtime, you can actually start even sooner. This is super controversial. Okay. So, and I, I, you know, do you start structured feeding at six months or at 12 months or not even till two years? And there's the attachment parenting crew who says, and there's Catholic attachment parenting people and there's Catholic, you know, people that are committed to structured parenthood. Um, and the church does not endorse any one method. I want to be very clear about that. But you can start, you can start structure very early, especially structured feeding and bedtime. Definitely not before six months. That's what I will say. And I think it's fine to wait till 12 months. There's an, there's an attachment parenting crew who says maybe not till two or three years. And I think the key point is, again, not the age, but really the child. A child with certain special needs, especially an adopted child, is going to need more time. Do you, you had mentioned when you said discipline and you pivoted to structure which I think for us is very similar. Some, some listeners might say, ooh, that's a totally different thing. Do you notice that the kids with better structure respond to discipline differently than kids with less structure? Is that an important foundation? I do. I think the kids need to, um, they, they rely on safety. They want to feel really safe. And structured schedules, knowing that dinners at the same time, bed times at the same time, we're going to do prayers. We're going to, you know, there's the same structure to bedtime, you know, brushing teeth, saying prayers, et cetera. That is the, that's the foundation of discipline. So Kathleen, we talked a little about negative reinforcement. Uh, these days there seems to be much more of a movement toward praising children. Well, how much praise is enough and how much is too much? You know, I, Actually, I think you, you can't praise a child enough. I, I'm going to go there. I, I think that tons and tons of support of children is very, very good, as long as you're also willing to give the negative reinforcement. The ah. problem isn't too much praise. The problem is removing any criticism. Ah, yes. And there is a movement for, for raising children only reinforcing the positive things and kind of ignoring the negative things they do. Right. And, and again, I, I, we, we have to be honest with our children. We have to be honest as, as, as adult Christians, honest in anything we do, but especially in parenting. A lot of modern parents are exhausted, and it's emotionally and physically. And it seems like they're more exhausted than maybe in generations past. So do you think that's true? And if so, what's behind it? I think that there's a sense that if you – um, that you're expected to do more and more and more for your children. And that if you set boundaries with your children that allow you as a parent to take care of yourself, that somehow you're not a good mom or dad. You know, you're not, if, if you're setting set, you know, boundaries that you're going to stay in your bed at bedtime and you're going to be allowed out of your room, you know, so many hours later. And lots of people have these, you know, red, yellow, green clocks, right? And this allows mom and dad to sleep at night. There's no end of content on the internet. And I will say, including Catholic content, that say you're scarring your child for life. And mm -hmm. uh, I think um, I, I, my answer to that is, is um, first and foremost, um, uh, love heals, right? If, you, if you're truly loving and committed to your child and they feel safe and they have structure, they will be healed. Um, but um, it's, it's not consistent with antiquity. I don't think... The human, you know, the human race has been setting bedtimes for most of human history, right? And there's wisdom and antiquity. But finally, I'm going to go back to the science because I'm a doctor and this is Dr. Doctor, right? So I think, <laughs> I, you know, there's actually a very interesting study. It's several years old now that looked at um, uh, uh, sleep training in infants. And 
it did show that infants who underwent sleep training had higher cortisol levels, levels that they were stressed from that. Well, that's not surprising. The baby's crying. They don't like it. They're going to be stressed. But at age seven, there was no increased incidence of psychiatric disorders among sleep trained babies than among babies that were not sleep trained. However, there was a higher incidence of depression amongst mothers who did not sleep train their babies. <laughs> mm, gotcha. Yeah. I think, you know, Kathleen, one of the things I see a lot of is this thought that if I'm working harder as a parent, I'm a better parent. And the harder it is, the better I am. Um, how how should people navigate how should people navigate that um you know in the airplane the way the um the, the the flight attendant tells you to put your own mask on before the child and you can't be a good parent when unless you've taken care of yourself unless you're fed and rested and you've had time for prayer and um you've had time with your spouse and uh and that child is going to keep taking and taking and taking and taking until there's nothing left of you. <laughs> so there's a tendency to think if I don't give all of that until I die, that I'm like a bad parent or even a bad Christian. But no, um, the Lord asks us to take care of ourselves first. What What would you tell? I, I feel like you, you bring up a good example that I, I see frequently where where folks might be coming to the point where they realize that I've kind of got nothing left to give and we've set up a, a pattern such that maybe I'm mostly ignoring the negative, hoping they'll kind of outgrow it or maybe it's a phase. But then very quickly you get to a point and, you know, staying in bed overnight is a great example. Uh, my child won't stay in bed overnight. Um, I'm at my wit's end. How, how do I fix this? What What are some ways for people who who feel like, okay, maybe we need to re-up our, our game for regimen. How do they turn that around? Um, I think first and foremost, you know that, you know, as they say, a stitch in time saves nine, right? That correcting a small problem in a toddler saves you correcting a big problem in a teenager, right? If you Amen. teach a toddler to, you know, not snack right before dinner, um, and have that self-control, then they're going to have the self-control to, you know, not smoke cigarettes when they're a teenager, right? And so letting little things go and thinking they're going to grow out of it um, isn't always the answer. Sometimes it is, actually. But you have to, this is where you have to use prayer to sort of guide it. Kathleen, that's a great place to take a break here in the middle of our interview. We'll be back after the break with more practical parenting tips here on Dr. Doctor. And we are back with Dr. Doctor and Dr. Kathleen Bershelman talking about raising and specifically kind of discipline uh, related to child rearing. So Kathleen, I've, I've got a question. You know, one of the, the things that a lot of people ask uh, is how much to expect of children. I think there is a big movement uh, afoot that, you know, they're only kids. Can we actually expect them to to help out? Um, are, are, are you going to get CPS called if they're mowing the lawn, that type of thing? Uh, at least at the Mulally House, Saturday, the way I was raised, Saturday is a work day, and that's when you, you get stuff around that you can't get to during the week. And I've carried that on with my kids. What what are good expectations for how much the kids can help out around the house? What What should we kind of expect of them? Right. So actually, we say that, that Saturday is family work day and Sunday is family rest day. And we really try to honor that in our house, too. Um, I, I think we can expect great things of them. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to do it. I'm going to be honest. But <laughs> we, can ex we can set the expectations high. And uh, especially for chores. And, and again, I, this is where I actually use history a lot. And um, so in our living room, uh, I, we have two bookends that are these irons. They were my, um, they're those old fashioned irons that you put on the stove to heat them. And uh, they were my husband's grandmother's iron, irons and she ironed for a living during the depression. And wow. that was how she supported her family. And 
Uh, we have other things that I mean, and you, any I bet any of us don't have to look back more than about two generations to see people who worked very hard, right? And so um, I, I have those pictures of those people in our house, and we tell the stories about how hard they worked. One of my favorite is um, a family with nine children in Rutland, Vermont, and all the cloth diapers strung up in front of the fireplace. And, <laughs> I, you know, and then it helps them be grateful for what they have. And that's one of the Birchman Ten Commandments is be grateful, not jealous. Right. And then I tell them, OK, so you're mowing the lawn today and we're uh, you're, you're right, actually going to be writing your literature paper and whatever the tasks are. And they do have some standard Saturday morning jobs like changing bed sheets, et cetera. So, Kathleen, one thing that I noticed in raising children, it seemed like they were exceptionally good at pushing my buttons and my wife's buttons. So how often is the case that children are, are actually trying to do that? And then what do we do as parents when we get so darn angry over it? Yeah. So I had a spiritual director and I said, you know, my kids just keep pushing my buttons. And she said, but Kathleen, I'm going to quote Seinfeld here. You installed the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I, I the the first thing we do now I'm going to quote Saint Ignatius from Seinfeld to quote Saint Ignatius of Loyola, um, but <laughs> Saint Ignatius says that uh, it, it talks constantly about naming things, naming spirits, right? When you um, and and, um, yes. and I think you have to name that it's a button, or in some cases I have one child who says she throws daggers. Oh my gosh, and. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, as soon as she starts doing it, we say, you're throwing daggers, you're throwing daggers again. And um, she's just saying things that aren't kind or that are really trying. She know their children know you so well that you can be pretty vulnerable and they know how to really hurt you and they can really hurt you. And I think we have to be honest about this. I think we have to name it that that's really unkind and you're really hurting me. And then set boundaries the way we do when anyone else hurts us, right? Like that we're just not going to continue this conversation right now and go in my room and close the door for a little while and then pick the conversation up later. That works with a teenager. Let's talk about the toddler, right? Um, the toddlers do it positive and negative. I, I remember a, a pre-verbal oh. child wanting, I was saying no more of junk food and he wanted it and he started trying to give me a kiss, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and uh, and in the same way that they, that same child is going to, um, you know, lay down on the floor and kick their legs and scream, right? And so um, this is where, you know, we, uh, it, even with that toddler, you say, I would be a bad mommy if I let you eat more junk food. I would be a bad mommy if I let you have what you don't want to have right now. And then as a parent, you do what you need to do. You drag them out of church or the store or wherever you are and give them a time out in their car seat. You know what? I guess one of the things I, I'm thinking back to to more of the nitty gritty. One one of the things that people might allege uh, against negative reinforcement is that it's it's like bullying in some ways. Um, what what are some of the most common mistakes that parents use or they accidentally commit when they're trying to apply negative reinforcement? How is that different than something that would be detrimental to the child? I think the most common mistake, uh, and I think all, I, I, I think every single parent, except for Our Lady, has fallen to this. Okay, is to get angry. So, um, once you're getting really angry at them, you're actually a really bad parent. <laughs> and that's when it's it's it, the best thing is if you have a spouse that can like take over then and you can leave, right? But that's not always possible. Um, and uh. When I'm really angry, I actually often choose to just like not parent and and pick up whatever the issue was later. Um, I'll even even with a toddler, I'll you know acquiesce to whatever it is they're throwing a fit about, right? And deal with it later if I am too angry to parent. And with a teenager that um, uh, uh, that's really angry, I'll just remove my. Uh, if I'm getting really angry, I'll just remove myself from them. So Kathleen, in, in parenting, there's also a role for, for mercy. How do we balance being a pushover with being merciful uh, with applying negative reinforcement when necessary? 
Right. So, how many times are we supposed to forgive? I'm asking you the quiz. 70 times 7. <laughs> 490. <laughs> God's mercy. How, how much mercy does God have? Right. Endures, infinite. 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 Endures forever, right? So, uh, unfortunately, or for better or worse, or fortunately, I think that's how we're called to be parents. And because uh, God's our model, right? Our Father in heaven. Um, now, if, it, but it's, it, it's not forgive and forget. It's forgiveness with boundaries, right? For that child. So um, whether it's a toddler or a teenager or a tween, you know, you're, you're going to give them another chance, but with a clear understanding of what went wrong. And, and there's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's different kinds of forgiveness, right? There's, we say there's three kinds of forgiveness, right? The first is something that's totally an accident, right? They accidentally spilled all the milk. Okay. You're forgiven. Let's clean it up together. Right. Okay, and you move on. The second is uh, where there's like not really contrition, right? And maybe they say sorry, but they didn't help you clean it up and you're not sure they're not gonna repeat the offense, right? And that's where you're gonna set some real boundaries here. There's mercy, but it's, mer but, but you're gonna be, you're gonna, you know, check the, the history on their computer in their browser, right? Um, and, and then the third type is of forgiveness is when there's a true contrition, there's a true and complete apology, um, without excuses. Now that's uncommon, but it does happen. And when it happens, you, know, <laughs> you got to forgive them no matter how hard it is. And, um, and, and I think that it, that, that that's how the Lord treats us too. You know, one of the things that some people might be feeling too is especially if if they're struggling with a child who it continues to be quite a handful i feel like some parents blame themselves for their children's poor behavior mm -hmm. how, how much of a child's behavior is related to the good or bad decisions of mom or dad yeah I and mean, the nature versus nurture question is that what you're asking Andrew? Yeah, yeah pretty pretty much i guess i actually think it's a lot more nature than nurture actually i think there's a huge it's, it's both there's no doubt but there's a huge component of temperament, which I know Tom loves to talk about. <laughs> and, um, and I, I now that doesn't mean that you don't parent. Quite to the contrary, it's that you know that, that there, there's many gifts in one spirit, and frankly, there's many crosses in one spirit. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. And so there's many gifts in your family and there's many different crosses in your family. And all those crosses make us all holy as a family. So Kathleen, there are some special circumstances. What do we need to consider? What do families need to consider where there might be only one parent in the home or a biological parent and a non-biological parent? Does that make a difference with discipline? Yeah, it does. I, and I think the, the single parent thing, um, is, is profoundly difficult, and we all have to work together to support our brothers and sisters in Christ who are single parents. And uh, this is where, um, you know, y y you may be at a point um, like where you're so angry, but you actually can't leave that child because you're in a grocery store or you're in the car, and like, and there's no place you can take that kid, right? And um, I, I think. Uh, this is where you get to a safe place if you're a single mom. And and, and let's be clear, it's, it, there's single parents who are single parents because, like, my husband's a single parent of seven. Every time I, you know, worked an overnight shift, I worked overnight shift. <laughs> like, now almost, actually, I'm over 20 years of working overnight shift, right? So my husband's a single parent of seven when I do it, right? And um, so there's lots of single parents. And um, this is where... You give a you give yourself a lot of a break. Like there's going to be a lot of quote bad parenting, <laughs> okay, because you're taking care of yourself. But the kids didn't die, and that's that sounds like me telling myself I'm a good dad. Everybody's still alive. You know, <laughs> I, I succeeded today, and I do I do look at it that way sometimes. I I'm wondering about another kind of special situation about um, when, unfortunately, sometimes families do fall apart and there's children going to mom's house and then to dad's house and the rules are different. 
um, I've seen a lot of stress related to that. What advice do you have? Yeah, so, you know, I've, I've spent more than 15 years in the pediatric ER, and we all know, and you talk to any pediatric ER physician, that Sunday night is when is the transfer of care in divorced families, and every Sunday night, the PEDS ER is full of kids who are just transferred from one parent to the other, and the new parent is there, not because the kid's really sick, but they want you to document something so that they can have that against the other parent. Oh, my goodness. And, and um, this is if you're in one of these situations, you need a counselor, your kids need a counselor, and you need a really good spiritual director. And every situation has to be to handle, uh, you know, based on the circumstances. Um, and it's, it's just extremely painful. What I can say is that there are um, faithful Catholic families that um, that survive this. And um and and raise their children in holiness and that that in and of itself is its own cross um and um you can embrace that cross too um and and reach out to other like it like every cross in parenting follow the example of the lord follow the example of the bible and follow the example of older parents you trust other people who have raised children that you trust and you've got to put those people in your life. We hit a point actually in our own marriage pretty early on where I, my husband and I looked at each other. He said, who do we look to for mentors and parenting besides our parents? And we, I, my parents were on the other side of the country. And we couldn't name one other family that was raising a Catholic family of, of our size. At that point, we had four children and that, were, that we actually knew well enough to talk to. And we were active in our parish. And so you know what we did? We went online and I got really involved in catholicmom.com. And that was actually the beginning of uh, everything I've done with online parenting and medicine. And you can find that community, even if you're reaching out to online communities, um, to your parish, you've got to find it. You've got to find those parents that you trust that have done this before you. I, I, I can't, I, I can only, amplify that because some parents didn't get a good example at their home. So then they're really stuck with an idea in their head. And if you haven't seen it incarnated in somebody's family, it's almost impossible to bring into your own family. But once you see it, you know, then you can do the, the WWJD thing. What would Jesus do? Or what would, you know, Bob and Helen do? You know, you, you can do that. And it's so valuable. So if I were a young parent, that would be my take home so far from this. Find somebody you trust that you want to emulate. And I love the Martin family. We can bring it back to that. You know, if you read the read the writings of Daily Martin, it, it, it reads like a modern day mom blog. I mean, she's like, <laughs> <laughs> she was ahead of her time. She was. Kathleen, as Catholics, how can the sacraments play a true role in parenting? Well, the sacraments are they're not a true role. They're essential. I mean, so so confession is like, it makes your job so much easier as a parent. If you <laughs> Once you realize that taking your kids to confession every week actually makes your whole life better, <laughs> you're going to be <laughs> the most faithful family ever there, right? But you're so, probably not allowed to fill out their examination of conscience for them, correct? <laughs> Sometimes I do. My husband yells at me. <laughs> We, we just had a first confession in our family, and uh, the siblings were all offering to help <laughs> with, with the first confession. That's togetherness. <laughs> um, so, so you need confession, and you need Eucharist. And, um, and, and then I think, you know, those very special sacraments uh, of first Eucharist and of, uh, of uh, confirmation um, really in, instill that grace that they need to grow in holiness and grow in virtue. Kathleen, when when would be a good time if a parent was concerned about their child's behavior or their discipline strategy? When should they bring them to their doctor? So I'm so glad you asked this, Andrew, because we cannot ignore what I call organic disease when it comes to parenting. And I think that's one of the most common criticisms I have of parenting books and even of the Catholic parenting literature. Um, and of the that there's so many people that think that their child's behavior is a hundred percent due to their parenting approach 
or mm. due to um you know it, it's some some action of the parent and they totally miss organic what i call the the biological structures of their brain that is the way the child was born whether this is autistic spectrum or adhd or oppositional defiant disorder or you know things like um, the um uh, other uh, other uh, uh, disorders such as bipolar in particular these disorders absolutely present in childhood as well as um you know what i call run of the mill depression and anxiety which and i call it run of the mill because it's so common now a child with an, uh, uh, with anxiety depression adhd symptoms needs to be seen and treated and you know the catholic church since the scientific revolution has supported the scientific method and allopathic medicine and the medical sciences. I know you all agree because this is Dr. Doctor. And, <laughs> and so in parenting children, it's our obligation to treat things like autistic spectrum and ADHD and depression and anxiety, just like we're going to treat their urine, their ear infection or, or their diabetes. Yes. I think a lot of times parents feel like, if the the child receives a diagnosis, it's because they're not parenting right or they need to do something different, but it sure is not organic disease and they might need treatment. But I think that's a huge take-home point for a lot of people. If if you're doing these things, you have the mentors, we're trying to help them grow in virtue, things are not working, it, there's a big role for, for modern medicine and the advice of your doctor. And you're not a failure of a parent for choosing to use, together with your doctor, choosing to use medication to treat a child. In fact, I think it's pride. If you ch if your child ha has a, a, a disorder that requires medication and you don't treat it, that's pride on the part of a parent. Yeah, who's that that's really it. hurting, actually? And Kathleen, we've got a little under a minute left. What are the final words of wisdom or resources that you would like to leave with our listeners? Well, first and foremost, I want to recommend uh, uh, prayer, right? There's no greater resource than Our Lady, and she was a perfect parent. We have no other one to turn to, and um, I, I think just reading reading the stories of the apparitions yourself um, and then turning to the Word of God in the Bible, um, and then pray for, pray for your children every day. I had one dad tell me that he um, had six kids and his steering wheel had six bumps on the top. So every day while he was praying, <laughs> oh, he neat. prayed for, he moved his hand along the steering wheel and prayed for all six of his kids. And figure out your method to remind yourself to pray for them all every day. And then you got to hug them every day. They need physical touch. If they're not, if you're not physically hugging and touching that child, especially the smelly teenager, especially the smelly teenager, if you're not physically touching them, they're going to find some other person that's going to get them. Kathleen, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom here on Dr. Doctor. We love having you. God bless you. God bless you. And we are back with Dr. Doctor. And Tom's medical trivia question today had a lot of different animal type moms, tiger moms, panda moms. And the I always think of that children book, Are You My Mother? No, I'm a snort. And we've got a snowplow <laughs> mom, not an excavator mom. What does what snowplow parents do for their children, Tom? You know, I've never heard of this until I researched the episode. They remove every obstacle from their children. So they're like that plow in front of their children. If there's something in the way, they're pushing it out of there. So they just have an easy way to go. And all I can think about is, you know, the stories of you know, the little kids who see the little chrysalis that a butterfly is supposed to emerge from. And they open the chrysalis and the butterfly can't fly because yeah. it can't, it didn't have to push against that to get itself out, to strengthen, to push the fluid into the veins of that. Uh, or, or like, you know, a baby bird that would be born without, hat, you know, chopping its way out of its own egg. Um, that, just, that can't be a good thing. No. And I, I, I would echo back to, can you expect a kindergarten teacher to do that for your child when she's managing 30 other kids? You know, um, uh, no, that's probably not, not going to happen. No, no, it's not. And, you know, I, I wonder if when people generally had bigger families like ours, if it was harder to fall into that because you've got so much that you're doing, you can't possibly 
Take away yeah. every obstacle. We, if if I was a parent, I would be called the survival parent. I think because the goal <laughs> is survival, uh, spiritually and physically, uh, ideally both. But uh, we're going to survive, and then you know, hey, you, you do the best you can, and hopefully, uh, I always pray that Saint Joseph can fill in the, the places that I miss in my my fatherhood. So, survival, Dad. What are your top three takeaways from this episode? Well, uh, I've, I've got a couple. I'd say number one, the goal of discipline in a child uh, is to grow in virtue. I think that's Amen. Pr- pretty good. And she came out right with that. Um, and the corollary to that is that none of us are perfect parents. So we're doing the best we can and we need to find mentors. And that's the way we can grow in virtue oh, as yes. parents. And then my number three actually would be what she said at the very end. Don't miss organic disease. I've seen uh, a, a lot of kids that would come in. Uh, they get to preschool or kindergarten, and then boom, it, we've got a big problem because the kindergarten teacher is not putting up with mom what mom put up with. And some of those kids have major medical problems, and it's like, we could have helped you years earlier. Other mm-hmm. kids, you just, just need standard discipline at home. And so it helps because uh, I'd say pediatricians and, and doctors in general have a sample size of thousands of patients. So if you're trying to figure out what the heck's going on here, get, get help and, and get it early. That's good because, yeah, the doctor does have a unique perspective that no parent can have who doesn't see that number of children. Yeah, I think it's so hard because when, when you have your, your little baby, you love them so much, and it's hard to impossible to look objectively at them. That's why doctors usually don't treat their family members because you can't right. be objective as a doctor. It is fortunately easy to be objective for other people's kids and, and hopefully give them some good advice. Andrew, thanks. That was a great top three. Thank you, listeners, for being with us and our guests for another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning official radio program and podcast, the Catholic Medical Association. We ask you to share the good news with Dr. Doctor with a friend, invite them to listen to their favorite podcast app. And you can find all of our episodes on our website, drdoctor.org. For those who want to dive deeper into some of the topics, check out the website for bonus links and information in our post for each episode. This is Dr. Tom McGovern. And Dr. Andrew Malala. We're signing off until your next dose of Dr. Doctor.